once more we find ourselves at the Pokemon franchise. Now, anybody that's played multiple Pokemon games can tell you that there are recurring trends in each generation, such as starter Pokemon, the version-specific breeds, and the Pikachu lookalikes. But one recurring group of Pokemon that's full of interesting inspiration are the fossilized Pokemon, both living and resurrected from their stony graves. I'm the Kitsune Hawk, and today we'll be taking a closer look at the fossilized Pokemon from generations 1 to 6. So get out your pencils, trivia enthusiasts, because this is character development. As to be expected, the best way to go about our Pokémon Paleontology lesson is to go in chronological order. Starting off with Generation 1, that is to say, the Ammonite line, the Kabuto line, and Aerodactyl. Ammonite and Amistar are quite simple, as their names are both puns on Ammonite, a type of shelled sea creature that lived roughly 400 million years ago during the Devonian period to 65 million years ago, unable to survive the same mass extinction that took out the dinosaurs. Ammonites were known to be prolific breeders, making their fossils among the most commonly discovered and recognizable. Interestingly, despite their similarity to modern nautiluses, the Ammonite is more closely related to today's squids, octopi, and cuttlefish, a fact that can be observed in Omastar's design, whose outer anatomy closely resembles that of a modern cephalopod. As for Kabuto, it's based on the so-called living fossil that we know as horseshoe crabs as was another easily recognizable fossil, the Trilobite. Kabuto's name also comes from Kabutogani, the Japanese word for horseshoe crab, as well as Kabuto, the Japanese word for helmet, similar to the appearance of both Kabuto and a horseshoe crab. As for Kabutops, this one's not too concrete, but is likely based on Eurypterinids, a type of ancient arthropod noted for their large arms, mainly used for swimming, but some genera, such as Mixopterus, featured clawed arms similar to the scythed arms of Kabutops. Eurypterids are also cited as potential ancestors of horseshoe crabs, so when you really think about it, Kabuto's a case of reverse evolution. Wrapping up Generation 1 is Aerodactyl, whose name is an obvious combination of Aero, the Greek word for air, and Pterodactyl, a genus of flying reptiles collectively known as pterosaurs, who lived at the same time as their dinosaur relatives. Its Japanese name, Putera, is also a play on pterosaur. There isn't much else to add here, other than that an actual genus of pterosaurs was named Aerodactylus in honor of the Pokémon. Now, Generation 2 doesn't add any new fossil Pokémon, so that leads us straight to Generation 3 and the Lilip and Anorith lines, along with Relicanth. Lilip and its evolution, Cradilly, are based on crinoids, better known as sea lilies. Much like the horseshoe crabs, crinoids are considered to be living fossils, dating back about 485 million years ago during the Ordovician period. Among the extinct orders of crinoids was Cladida, which only thrived during the Middle and Late Devonian period, about 390 to 360 million years ago, so it's very possible that Cradily's name is derived from both Cladida and Sea Lily. As for Anorith, it shares the Trilobit inspiration with Kabuto, but may physically be based on Brine Shrimp, better known as Artemia, which have existed since the Triassic period about 250 million years ago. As you can see here, the eyes and legs of both Anorith and Artemia are remarkably similar. Going back even further, specifically to the early Cambrian period, there exists an ancestor of shrimp named Anomalocaris, whose name and appearance have a number of similarities to both Anorith and Armaldo. Now you may ask why I threw in Relicanth, a Pokémon that isn't brought back to life from a fossil. Simple, really. Relicanth is the Pokémon series' true living fossil. Relicanth is based on the Coelacanth, an order of fish that was long believed to have gone extinct during the Cretaceous-Paleogene mass extinction 65 million years ago, the same event that wiped out the dinosaurs. In 1938, the Coelacanth was rediscovered off the coast of Southeast Africa, with another species found in Indonesia in 1999. Much like the Coelacanth, Relicanth is only found in a select few locations, usually in deep waters. Generations 4, 5, and 6 each have two lines of fossilized Pokémon introduced. Starting with Generation 4, that gives us Cranidos and Shieldon. Cranidos and its evolution, Rampardos, are both based on a dinosaur named Pachycephalosaurus, which lived in North America during the Cretaceous period and was known for its thick skull, allowing it to headbutt as a method of defense. Shieldon and Bastiodon, on the other hand, walk on all fours, meaning that their inspiration is likely from a Ceratopsian dinosaur. Considering that Shieldon lacks horns, this would most accurately align it with Protoceratops, which was smaller than most of its relatives and did not have horns like those of its later descendants. As for Bastiodon, its uniquely shaped face is closest to the Zuniceratops, 
which had a sort of wall-shaped face and two distinctive horns above its eyes. Generation 5 gives us the Tertuga and Archon lines. Tertuga and its evolution, Caracasta, are based on Protostega and Archelon, two extinct genera of sea turtles, both dated to the late Cretaceous period. Protostega, just like Tertuga, was the smaller of the two, so it makes sense for Caracasta to be based on the largest species of sea turtle yet discovered. Archon and Archaeops are quite simple, as their first bird Pokémon title easily affirms their inspiration as being Archaeopteryx, also known by the name Urvogel, German for first bird. Archaeopteryx is believed to be one of the earliest ancestors of birds, living only during the late Jurassic period 150 million years ago. Lastly comes the fossil Pokémon of Generation 6. Tyrant and Tyrantrum are rather obviously based on the most famous dinosaur genus of the Cretaceous period, Tyrannosaurus. They do, however, borrow physical characteristics from other carnosaurs, such as a crest similar to those of the Cryolophosaurus. Lastly, that gives us Amora and Aurorus, who get their basic body shape from the Diplodicoidea family of dinosaurs, and crests from the genus Armagosaurus. The name Amora itself is also a combination of Amargosaurus and Aurora. Hate to have dragged on longer than usual here, but I hope you've learned a bit of basic paleontology from this analysis, as I'm always interested in seeing what fossil Pokémon get introduced with each generation, and I can't wait to see what else follows. This has been Character Development. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to leave your feedback in the comments, as well as any suggestion and criticism you feel like mentioning. You can also use the annotations to see some lovely videos I'd recommend, or you can watch the last episode on August from Osura's Wrath. Probably one of my favorite episodes so far.